Hey everybody and welcome to this week's Fight Chat Friday. Uh, apologies, we're just a couple of minutes late with some technical issues, but I'm sure the interview will be worth the wait. Today we are chatting with Miss Julia Cross, MBE, who is six times world champion, 15 times European champion in ITF Taekwondo, and the most successful female, com- female competitor in our sport. Really looking forward to this one. Hope you enjoy it. Well, Miss Julia Cross, how on earth are you? I'm very good, thank you. All the better for seeing you two. We've not seen each other for a while now. Far too long. Good to see you both. Way too long. Way too long. Way too long. You know, it was one of those things that uh, when we were preparing for this interview, I had that thought of, uh, yeah, when did I actually meet you first? And I was thinking to myself, there's a picture, a black and white picture jumped into my mind that I have. Uh, it's not that long ago. There actually were color <laughs> photographs, but we had a, it was, it, w- it was back in about 1999 or 98. And I had gone to a tournament in Dublin and uh, uh, Miss Cross was visiting with Master Sutherland. And there was a, a team over from Scotland and I was taking my first team as a coach of junior competitors up to a tournament so I'd just taken over uh, the club from the previous instructor and it was my first time taking the team to a tournament and uh, Julia was there fighting and would have been the first time that I'd seen her fighting in person and we just it happened to be that one of the parents uh, of one of the kids was a photographer a bit of an amateur photographer and he happened to get a great photograph which obviously I couldn't find uh, but a great photograph uh, Julia fighting Susie Fines uh, and it was just one of those ones where it's, it's uh, looking over a sidekick I think Susie was going out of the ring Julia's pushing her out of the ring and it was like oh that would be great to have for this interview yeah, and of course the photo one. has vanished so you know uh, <laughs> we'll, ha- we'll have to find something like that later but that for me that was my first time uh, uh, seeing you in competition uh, and uh, you know it, it was definitely uh, it imprinted the, the style of sparring that you have imprinted in my mind from there and of course much later than that or years after that I would have met you at international championships and uh we've we've been chatting and uh friends for some years now but uh what i'd like to start with is how would you describe your your style of sparring you know for throughout your com- competitive career well i think it evolved over the years obviously when i started it was you were just kind of baby feet and trying to learn what you did and when we started mm. going to international competitions then you saw this bigger picture of like oh they're doing that they're doing this so we always went back and said right we don't want to be like them but how can we beat them so how would i describe my style of sparring i think yeah. sometimes sometimes i was barbaric sometimes i knew who was fighting then i had to be on the back pedal and then sometimes I knew who I could stalk out the ring. So with every fighter, it was different. But I tried to always be in control of the ring. That was probably one of my biggest mm. things. They always wanted to be in control. First principles. Yeah, and I think that's actually something that we picked out a few clips for today, obviously. And that is something that really jumped out to me. That that Just that control that you had in the ring. And what's what sprung to mind instantly was I remember you had a, a podcast with Jamie, shout out to the Black Belter podcast. <laughs> and you yep. mentioned that you, you started off in your first tournament against green, as a green belt, sparring a black belt uh, boy. So then mm-hmm. I was wondering, maybe you got that intensity and that ferocity, maybe coming up through the ranks in that, in that kind of a situation. I think I've always been feisty as growing up and my mum was always like, oh God, right. But when I started sparring the first competition as a green belt, I remember this black belt boy, he just battered me, and I'm talking, and I remember leaving going, I'm never, ever going to let that happen. I think that's when the fire grew inside me. I went, right, and I was only 12 at the time, remember? So I had to really kind of go, right, that's not happening again. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you can see that, and we can see in the clips that like that, that intensity that you bring to it, it's just, I, I imagine once you step onto that mat, it's just like it's a, there's a switch there. And it's like, okay, it's game time, let's go. I think if you listen to the podcast, I spoke to Jamie about how all the preparations, I won't go into it, but I only let the adrenaline come inside me once I stepped, not before the mat, like actually on the sparring ring. And that's when I let it go. And then the fire just went, right, let's go. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. 
because for many people it is all about the you know the, the preparation to get across and onto the ring is the hype it's almost like mm. um you know gearing yourself up for battle and you know that feeling of you have to get the, the the mentality in the right place but it's a different place for everyone you know and what you need uh part of the challenge is finding out what you need to get you ready to be in the ring i think for everybody it's different and for that the way i did it, it worked for me i did the warm-up like i said in the podcast I did mm. everything before. I wasn't going to jump about half an hour before I went on. So I knew I'd be exhausted by the time I got in the ring. So I went I went to sleep, got up, got the <laughs> mental prep sorted out and then stepped on the ring and had all these preparations to do my head go, right, let the fire, let the fire just come up inside you and go, let the adrenaline rise. Yeah, I think... We- I think we found a few nice clips. I mean, unfortunately, it'd be great if people were traveling back in time with HD cameras and live streaming the tournament. We'd have so much more, but it's not the way. So uh, we have found, though, some, I think some really good clips that illustrate some of the features of your sparring style and what made you competitively successful over a prolonged career. And also that illustrate those differences you were talking about and how you might approach different competitors in different matches differently. And, uh, you know, we might just jump into one of them just to get us kicked off and started. Um, and I think the first one I want to maybe look at is uh, from one of the, the UK Impact Opens uh, and sparring, uh, I think, who, a person who's still a good friend of yours, uh, uh, Michelle Redmond, who I don't think is Michelle Redmond anymore. But, but there you go. I know. Sorry, I know what you're going to say. She's still one of my best friends. And yeah. This is the only time I've ever had my rib broken. She had one of the strongest psychics in the world. She had a brilliant psychic, or, and I remember feeling it going, oh. Oh. and I told her after, I went, you broke my rib. Uh, <laughs> She's like, best nice. of friends. We're, oh, we're well, look. still the best of friends. Oh, that's super. That's super. Well, let's have a quick look at that, and uh, I'll, I'll try to make sure that I pull up the, uh, the right one uh, as we go. Uh, so, yeah. One of the things that stood out to me in this particular clip as well is, is your ability to lead very comfortably off both sides. Um, was that something that you kind of you see here, a little switch as well? Was that something that you actively kind of trained to be just as dominant on each side? Uh, most definitely. Obviously, I want to give credit to it. It wasn't just me, but obviously Grandmaster Sullivan taught me the way and my coach for most of my world and European titles was Master Heath Denham. And, he always said, and Grandmaster Sullivan did, you need to work both sides equally. You don't want to be dominant one side and then you can't switch and you can't kick with the other leg. So that was always installed in me from a young age. So I worked on both sides and Master Denham was just incredible going right. Left side's not as good, work this twice as much. So that's what we did. And it is a it is a trait that is far less common now, don't you think? I mean, if you're looking mm. at uh, you know modern day competition, you don't see people changing legs that often. You don't. You usually see people just standing with their favourite leg forward, and I think they're scared to switch it up because they're not confident with the other side. And I think mm. that's a mistake people are making these days. Imagine you can use both legs the same. Your competitor's going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. And I think yeah, that was did, one of my good points. Did, did you think that that was actually something that you were able to capitalize with? The whole idea that maybe some people weren't as comfortable on the flip side, that you were able to bring it, bring a bit more of a fight to them on a particular side if you could get the switch? I definitely do, because obviously we didn't have Facebook and watching all the fights and everything mm. before. But I just had to remember, but I always remember my coach, Master Denham, and saying if you can go off both legs and just switch your stance up keep switching your stance they don't know what's coming whereas one person would just stay side 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 then you could i used to figure out somebody's style within 10 seconds that's a that's a skill in itself really isn't it just that being able to read the situation and see what it is because we always talk about it on the show as well that for for us itf sparring is such a short competition two two minutes if you can't yeah. figure your opponent out quickly, the game's over before you, you realise it. But we worked on this a lot with Master Denham and obviously Grandmaster Sutherland. And obviously I worked with uh, Master Willie Van de Mortel for just a year. But within these three people, all these things came together. And everything that came out was you work both sides equally. And then 
within 10 seconds, you figure out their stance. If they change stance, if they don't, you do and see what they mm. do. Well, it's interesting because we've had a, a, a little bit of a video sequence there um, not so very long ago when we were looking at uh, beating left-legged fighters or at least, you know, when both people have the opposite leg lead. And, you know, because left-legged fighters spend a lot more of their time sparring right-legged fighters, they're used to that particular arrangement. And most, you know, right-legged fighters aren't as used to it. They've certainly encountered it, but they don't spend as much time dealing with someone who has the opposite leg in front. Um, and what it means is different shots are open. You're, you know, if you enter with hands, you'll often end up with your foot on the wrong side or, you know, it, it, it messes things up a little bit for you. And I think, you know, you can see even in some of these clips, you end up in situations like that and uh, improvise and adapt. And I think it's, it's probably just, you know, because you yourself are sparring off of both sides, you're, you're going to be equally comfortable sparring people who are, right-legged or left-legged, it's not going to make as big a difference to you as it might to others in that case. I remember if somebody was sparring right leg forward, cause I was always like a side kick. Yeah, the right leg was always my stronger one. But if they mm. put right leg forward, I would deliberately change to the left to see what they would do, because then I could do the hooking kicks underneath or like different things. So obviously, Master Denham and I, we worked on that to do it. So. We did a lot of practice on change stance, see what they do, change stance, see how they kind of react to it. Mm. And, and in particular in this clip as well, I think that the ability that you have with that side kick sets up the back kick you had really, really nice. And I, I always remember we did a seminar years ago in Cork and you, <laughs> you really you really highlighted your um, your unique your, and your individual way of using your side kick. And it always stood to me, but, but when you can see it here, you can really see that that knee is inside and it's it's not it, the hip is turned over almost and i thought it was quite yeah. unique and it's not really something you see but you can see then as you're in the ring you see that the return you're getting on it the, the distance the power and and the, the automatic um setup it brings with the back kick as well in that tight space because i always remember obviously master denim master willie it's like you need to lead with your heel the heel is for the side kick it doesn't mean your knees down but your body's slightly over, which means you can turn your body so you're out of reach, so somebody can't get you with a reverse punch. Mm. So that this was in Philadelphia, the similar. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting thing because I was wondering was there any link with uh, Master Van der Mortel as well because some of his initial seminars in Ireland, you know, the the side kick and the particular stance and being that side facing you know, was a little bit new to a lot of us at that stage and really clashed with any work that we were doing with, with say, um, uh, the Polish style of things and Master Yedus. So we were very much in a, like a half to even almost more front facing stance because of how the mm. Polish sparred at the time with a lot of lateral movement. And so you had Master Van Immortal with a very, very side facing, as you said, a heel prominent, uh, a closed off side kick. Um, and it was that, you know that combination of the 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 very tight side kick the back kick the jumping punches that you know was a huge feature i think of his particular way of thinking and i don't know which came first the chicken or the egg there so i mean i don't know how much of that you <laughs> borrowed from him or how much of that he borrowed from you but there you go oh no no i got it from master willie without a doubt because i trained with him before argentina in 89 he said julia you don't just kick with your leg you kick with your whole body that's why you lead with your heel and you just give that slight turn, not a full turn, so then you're kicking with your whole body, which gives it so much more power than just kicking with your leg. And that always stuck mm. with me massively. And, yeah. and we, we can even see it here in this photo that like the setup of it, if you do get pushed back to that side where you are turned, it, it's such an easy setup for the back kick automatically, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's almost inviting it in. Exactly. So this isn't the same clip. clip is it? Yeah. It's in the oh, yeah, there we go, yeah. Just automatic it's there. Always there ready to shoot. Yeah, because it's one of those things where uh, you know, I, I find that it, it you know, if you're going to have we we'll say the, the cost benefit of having the side kick in that way, you are taking that slight risk that you get knocked off and your blind side is open. So you need a mm -hmm. shot like that back kick to to be able to cover yourself for those few times when the kick gets deflected or you know you, uh, the person moves your angle is slightly wrong you skid off the side of their hip and land to their to their back you know and it, it seems to be quite an instinctive reaction for you there 
it definitely is because some of the times we worked on just faking the psychic that it wasn't actually going to hit and when I threw it sometimes I knew it wasn't going to hit because I knew they would come in then it was they were wide open for the back kick and that's why we worked on we drilled 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 so it just came automatic so I think sometimes I was better with the stronger fighters on the backward psychic than I was in the forwards because I set them up yeah when I when I knew it was a weaker fighter then I could push 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 but with like the stronger ones like Alona and the Christian and the Christina I knew yeah. what they were going to do so sometimes it was just and Willie taught me a lot of this was like set up set up set them up to bring them in and so it's it's, it's, it's such a it is such a mental thing. I mean, if it, you know, you know, it's going to be the biggest match for them as well. You know, it, I mean, it's a huge deal for them. You know, you, you're carrying a certain reputation, and whenever that happens, it's a big deal for both fighters because the person with the reputation doesn't want to be, you know, doesn't want to lose. They have like the rep- reputation to preserve, or they have their own expectations which have been set by prior experience. But the person who's stepping into the ring has nothing to lose uh, in that sense. But when you give them what they want. You know, you give them, uh, you know, what they're hoping to get. It, it makes them certain. It makes them predictable a little bit, you know. So if you can, and you often see this in the last, you know, 30 seconds of a match where if, if you're winning, but you offer the person the shot that will get them out of it, you offer the headshot, you offer them the, you know, you, you invite them to the corner of the ring or whatever, and you give them what they want, well, they're going to take it. And that makes your counter that bit more certain. That makes your strategy that bit more certain. Mm. I mean, most definitely, because I was always very aware when I won the first world that people are going to want to beat you. So I went back with coaches and said, right, I'm so aware. I want to go in, in that ring, the next world, I want to win it. But I'm not going in as world champion. I want to go in and win it. So I'm, I wasn't going in as Julia Cross world champion. I was going, I know they all want to beat me. So I need to try something different so that they can't beat me. Mm, the contender mindset. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the the comments here, but we we've got a, a comment from Harry Hill who says, "Bat Kate in the house." <laughs> there you go. What was that? Bat Kate in, in the house. Bat Bat Gate. Nice. That's where that's where he started oh, out. Bat Gate. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. The drama of Sullivan. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's nice. So we obviously have a we have a local. Um, so yeah, speaking of those big matches, this one, Crisha Lopez. Uh, you yeah. know and. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, in so many ways, and, and like many of Gra- uh, Grandmaster Lands fighters, the, uh, you know, that strong front leg into the hands, you know, w- was certainly a feature of her game. Uh, but I, I think this uh, clip kind of highlights the sidekick off of both sides and, the, the you know, the, the different ways of c- getting it to land, the slightly different changes in footwork. So um, is there anything that uh, I suppose that you want to uh, highlight or talk about in terms of how this kind of a match or that kind of an opponent uh, set your thinking? I mean, Christian was always one of my toughest competitors. She was very forthcoming like I was, so I always had to think. But what I knew about her was that she had a really high chamber on her side kick, Mm. so her knee was up really high, so Mm. I could get under it. Um, And when she came forward with a high knee side kick, she could never hit me with it because her knee was high, she was kicking down the way. So I knew how to parry it, but I knew I had to spin on it or jump on it, because she would just come in. If I didn't move with her high knee side kick, she would just uh, come in with her hands. Uh, just yeah. Speaking of it, like the defense as well, I noticed that in a lot of clips, you, you almost preferred not to take any contact at all. I don't know if that was something conscious where you didn't want to maybe show the referees that maybe you were being hit, that any time that they threw a shot, you were either going directly to counter or you were shoulder rolling and being out there. You were never kind of playing on the edge. You were either in or you were out. It was simple as that. Never did that. And my instructor always said, you don't play the game. And Master Denham and Willie was like, if you need to get your equipment fixed, do it. But I remember a couple of times getting winded fixing my shin guard for like two seconds going right fine and never showed any any pain ever because that's a I, weakness I, can, yeah can we quote uh, uh massive and immortal on that and keep smiling <laughs> there was always that <laughs> <laughs> keep smiling yeah 
that's the one. Uh, and I, I think that was a Dutch thing as well, because like, I, I did quite a bit of training with uh, Hiel Rombut as well. And he mm-hmm. had that, you know, yeah, he was a tough nut as well. And, you know, there was there was definitely no showing any, uh, you know, the harder you got hit, the bigger your smile. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely puts people off when they've sunk their hardest shot into you and you just smile at them and it's like, oh, OK. Um, but, but I think, I think sorry, when we were training, we were so conditioned because I used to train with obviously Master Denham and guys. So I was used to getting like hit mm. like really, really hard. So when it came to most females, not all of them, because some of them like Tristia, they, they hit hard. But most yeah. of them are like, that's OK. It doesn't bother me. Do you so think that I was, was a big... That. Do you think that was a big part of your success as well, being able to train with so many different people, including the guys, being able to get in there and Absolutely. hit that little bit harder? Yeah, Yeah, and they never took any mercy on me. Mm, which is good, really, okay. because you probably, look at you now, you, you have the titles to back that up. All the bruises okay, in the training like, hall. They didn't punch me in the face too hard, which <laughs> I was like, okay. But no, I'm really thankful for it because... You're sparring with somebody that's like 20 kilos heavier than Dean. Mm-hmm. It's like, if I can take that shot, I can take it off anybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's a different feature of the game. So, I mean, the shots that we saw traded with uh, Christian there, uh, you know, if, if we brought up the matches with uh, Christina Jelenic as well, you'd, or Ilona, you'd see the same. The, 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 tra- the trades and exchanges with hands, I just don't think you see that now. Like, I think the referees are stepping in so much earlier. But I did find just this one in all of the videos. <laughs> I know uh, what you're going to do. <laughs> where you got a minus point. You, like, it, it, in all the matches I saw, I don't think I ever saw one. And, and you know, and when you see some of the, some of the shots that land later on, uh, it, it might seem surprising to today's competitors. But, you know, it, it used to be a thing that we just got punched in the face like this and it was considered mm. part of the game. But in today's game, she would have got the minus point because she kicked you in the back. So it's funny how that, <laughs> that transpires now. I watched it today. I watched all the clips and I watched it and I was like, yeah, because I punched like kind of like that. The best yeah. swing. Instead of straight. So I was like, okay. But... <laughs> I took it on the chin and went, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, like, on, on your punching as well, I, I think that you, like, in today's game, they tried to, this was a great clip there, this one that I just shown. You got into the pocket, into the into the range, and you tried to punch as fast as you could, as hard as you could. And I think that that allowed the referees to give you that time in the pocket. You weren't trying to drive people back and people were falling over and it gets messy. You, you literally stayed in there. So, like, you're in there, you're in the pocket, one, two, three, four, as fast as you can and get back out with, with good hard punches. It's not really something that we see today or in general, to be honest, but being able to be in that pocket, give a nice quick trade off and get out of there again. And I think it's a shame because, like we said, we trained to do the points, get in, get out, move around, get back center. And we worked on so much on like the front hand jab. And I remember always going in the first fight saying, right, the first punch I'm going to hit as hard as I can and see what I can get away with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that philosophy yeah. well. Mm. But, you know, <laughs> and what's very, very interesting, though, is, like, you know, if, if we were talking about some of the previous things we've done, we've talked tactically about, you know, the adjustment, like coming off the sidekick and dropping into a position. Like this one in particular, this is definitely not where you want your foot to be while you're punching. Yeah. But... The punch, like, like you've got your shoulder, yeah, you've got your shoulder around to the proper side. You, you know, you've been able to deliver a front hand punch there. That's like that. That's certainly effective and certainly felt. And you know, I think what we we wouldn't see that kind of front hand front hand repeat now. I think what we'll see is that like that the the body position will change. You'll have that commitment to going forwards. And I think the biggest difference is that yeah, you're you're kind of you're coming down off of a kick now and landing. Uh, you know, with the body still half or side facing. And so it is a case of it's that front leg, front hand, front hand kind of combination. Uh, And I think, you know, it's something that we don't see as much anymore, but you could certainly see the effect of it. I can remember that clip, the clip, the first one you showed in Argentina, because I I remember it, it's my first world title, and I remember falling forward after the kick going, I just need a punch, I just need a punch now and get out, because I knew I was falling. There's Giles so. coming in. He, he's questioning this oh. uh, idea of not many minus points. 
No, uh, like I, I have to say, we watched uh, a good eight or ten matches. Only one minus point that I came across. So you know, sorry, Jules. It's um, I guess you just got to toughen up a little bit. <laughs> I can't see that. Sorry, guys. I'm on my phone, my laptop. No Can worries. Jules uh, has so... said uh, minus points. Miss Cross Punch is hard enough to knock me down still, and we all get made to train both legs, Jules. But uh, there you go. There you go. But, uh, you know, and again, that is one of the questions, isn't it? Is, uh, you know, when you look at what was useful to you when you were competing and what still carries through and what do you still hold as being a fundamental truth for your competitors? Mm, good question. Really good question. Um, also, you know, I've had Jules and Michael, Gemma and Katrina since they were like four or five. And I think I've tried to install them. Uh, what I did as a competitor in my routines, my philosophies and kind of just hard work ethic and if you want to achieve something you, you have that in, set, in your mind, so you make a plan and you go towards that goal and there's no other way about it, so I've given them things over the years but I'm so proud of these guys because they and girls I hope and I know they do, they just have this amazing work ethic that you have to work, work, work if something goes wrong, you work it ten times more. Now, I used the to come off fight right. sometimes. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, I used to, I used to come off fights and go, oh, I didn't do that. I didn't do this. So I used to go away, even if I won. I'd be like, I didn't do that. Right. I need to work on that because I was never happy with the way I performed. I never ever once came off and oh, I was brilliant. So I think that's not the right way to be. Mm. I think uh, so I hope yeah, I've so, installed that in them. Yeah, so I think the 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 work ethic and the principles uh, is definitely kind of coming across as like yeah, that's the thing that starts it all off. That makes the you know that carries through over generations of competitor. Those are things that are like their values, their principles, and uh, and they underlie the whole thing. Do you feel like you're uh, coaching differently? Uh, in terms of the techniques and strategies or you know what would be the things that still hold true in terms of techniques and strategies from that time oh good question we spoke about this yesterday a little bit mm. and, uh, i'm not gonna lie over this last year i feel like i've lost a bit of my edge as a coach and i can't wait to get back into it and give my guys and girls what they need but everybody's different so jamie Gemma's dad he's one of my coaches and he's brilliant so we talk about what everybody needs because everybody's different but trying to install the same thing and everybody work on your strengths but work on your weaknesses harder because then if something goes wrong with your psychic 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 if you don't have anything else what have you got mm. oh for sure for sure we have a, a little question in here from Nico. We might just pop that one out. Uh, so, Miss Cross, did you train for sparring and patterns equally or more for sparring? Tell them to listen to the podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll no, drop that into the chat there. But uh, the, the quick answer is... <laughs> no, to, an to answer the question, yes, in the beginning, I trained more sparring. I was rubbish at patterns. Grandmaster Sullen said, yep, you're not going to get your black belt if you don't train more patterns. So I did. Then I started getting good. I was like, oh, great, like these. So <laughs> Euros and Worlds, I trained equally for them, always, until my hip started to get bad. Then I, I trained more sparring because I was very aware I couldn't do what I needed to do in patterns. Yeah, I wonder, do, do many people know that your first European title was power breaking? I, I, that would be not a good, many, uh, no. <laughs> did you know, kind of comp uh, question there for people. And I think uh, Adrian O'Mahony on here is winding you up. He's asking you how much you train for special technique. Oh, God. <laughs> I'll, phone, I'll phone him later. Yeah, yeah. You, you, um, you can give him the honest answer to that. <laughs> I wasn't the best at special technique, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't my forte, so. Uh, it was just you brought a little bit of extra gravity around with you, that's all. He it loves kept, to, I, I'm, I, I'm sure it kept you grounded. Um so there is a, a little bit of a clip that I want to uh, have a look at here and it, it, it does kind of relate to some of the things that have worked. Sorry, that's the wrong one. I don't want to do that one just yet. I want to have a look at this one. Let's see. Um, so really kind of the, the principles we were talking about or you started to talk about earlier it was that ring control, that pressure and holding the center of the ring. And yes, we spoke a little bit about just the 
you know, maintaining that forward pressure where possible and against, you know, particular opponents, maybe not so much. But that pressure to keep the person on the edge of the ring under that kind of space pressure and time pressure almost. Uh, and this was, I think, a, a nice example of that in action. Yeah. I, what, what I want to know about this is... Uh, these days, the, the live scoreboard was just coming in, I think, wasn't it? Where you have this, the warnings were up and it's, the time was up, but not the scores. Is that right? Correct. Uh, yeah. Only warnings, round and time. That was it. You didn't know who was up. You only knew your warnings. Mm. And this was so in I, uh, 2009. I, in, in, was this the final? Yes. No. Oh, was that the final in 2009? Yep. Wow! Yeah, you look like you're dominating that, to be honest. And and I know that that didn't go the way. So the only way I can I can see that is they're scoring as this girl is leaving the ring, which isn't the score. Like here, she didn't land that in the ring. But um, anyway, I, I, what I wanted to know is were were you conscious of the warnings back then, even though they weren't as visual as they are now in terms of how they flipped the score from side to side? Was that something that you were very conscious of to build warnings for your opponent? <coughs> That's a hard one because before this, you saw warnings, but I was very one to try and not watch the scoreboard because I always thought it would take it off my mm. train of thought and my coach would shout, no more warnings, or like, you've got three or you've got two. So I just listened to him because I didn't okay. want to go and watch the scoreboard. Mm. For me, it was pointless and I always kind of kept a track in my head. Well, not always perfectly but i always thought like one like two i need to get her out i need to get her yeah. out yeah because it seems so, like you yeah, do was... rack up a lot for the opponent like a lot all the clips we've seen you you've like come forward at people like a truck and and really drive them on the back foot a lot of the time putting lots of pressure on them and you, you build up maybe six or seven warnings every match which is which is good as, as two points and not only just two points but two points on all four judges as well which is like very very valuable that was always one of the game plans to keep center to get them out of the ring as much as possible to so they racked up warnings mm. yeah for me definitely it was a thing that you know it, it wasn't as obvious i think uh you know i certainly didn't think about it as much while i was competing and then uh it started to make more of an impact on me or more of a like a, an impact on my mindset when i was refereeing and sitting at the top table and seeing the the scorecards come back you know on paper but we didn't do that in our regional tournaments in ireland or our national tournaments we just did you know clickers and you know so the scores were always way higher and the warnings counted for way less but once we started traveling abroad and looking at the like how the scorecards of the the paper scores were coming back in how the you know and eventually when the scoreboards came up we realized oh my god we're losing so many matches here or you know so many matches are being determined because the scores are so close by the number of warnings so mm -hmm. you know i think having that as a, a good anchor for your style is a, a a very important uh you know feature that still very much holds true now and i think in my day we worked a lot on ring craft i think a lot of people nowadays working it more but back then i think it was quite a not a new thing but obviously master den was like right we need to work the ring you need to be in center if you're on the, the corner you need to figure out a way to get back in the center so you're always in control okay it didn't work all the time but majority you're of the time aware. it kind of did and i was always mm. aware i need to move around we worked a lot on like shoulder turns to get away from the sidekick to get to like to bypass if you like to get back in charge okay you're avoiding mm -hmm. the contact but you're off the side of the ring did, did you prefer initiating with hands more than legs or did you have a, a preference there <clears throat> again depending on the opponent mm. so yes we worked loads on hands because in the beginning i wasn't so great at hands i'm not gonna lie i always relied on legs 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 and then we decided right we need to work on hands more so you we can, did, can, and then we had both. Yeah, because you can see that, like even the things in the earlier clips, like like the double front hand. It's not really something that you see, but it's so so effective. Like it's, it's usually you go left, right, left, right, but just getting that extra one in there all the time. It, it seemed like it was <clears> on your mind to get as many shots in as possible in the short time frame. But did you see I turned the shoulder around? Mm. So you did one, two. So you're not you're not square facing. So then you can kick or you can you can shift. Exit with a shot, yeah. Clear. Yep, clear points. 
Yeah, and the other thing that it lets you do, I think an awful lot of the time, and you know, it doesn't show up in all the clips, but it let you be almost on the blind side of the person that you were punching. So, you know, you were punching almost around their front shoulder. So it's very, very hard to come out of that position uh, to, to start getting your own hands back in action. So, you know, if you could follow in from the sidekick, even we have that one clip where you you know you land to the you know with your foot to the backside, but because you're over there, you know you've kind of got under the front arm and you're you know or around the front arm and you're punching to the face. So when that kind of thing happens, it's you know it's a very it's not a defensible position for the other person. It's really really difficult to go from there. Um, I don't know that you necessarily plan you know that to be how it works out. I think sometimes you just find yourself there, but having that shot loaded and as you said the shoulders in in a good position to uh let you finish you know it, it it's definitely something that i don't think we end up with as often now simply because of where like the psychic isn't a fully committed psychic for most mm -hmm. most fighters it's not it isn't that you know heel leading it tends to lead more with the you know the, the elevated foot the higher chamber uh it's a bit more uh, Carl Van Roon calls it, uh, a, you know, a kind of a, a like a, a multi-chamber or I think he has another nice word universal for it. Universal chamber. Universal chamber, yeah. So it, it's the kind of like, it can do a kind of a side kick, a kind of a turning kick, a kind of a hook kick, a kind of an axe kick, but it's not, you know, it's not committing itself to any of those. And that has its advantages. Uh, and from there, you can land to hands in a nice traditional, like half-facing, full-facing kind of way. But go, coming from your style, you've ended up with a punch that's very difficult to deal with because of where you land your front leg. I think I worked so much on footwork and all different scenarios that I was kind of prepared for everything and we were always kind of taught you just fight until the referee says stop. As long as you're not like hooking, if you can turn and punch at the correct angle, yeah. there's no reason why you can't do it. And then mm. if I'm falling forward, I'm going to punch. I'm going to keep punching or kick until they say stop. Because if I'm going forward, I'm going to fall. I'm going to keep doing stuff. And another thing that comes up there, and we, we do have this in a couple of the clips, is the connection with the turning kick. So, uh, yeah. you know, and, and there's there's quite a few a, a, quite a few nice combinations that emerge coming out of it where. Uh, once you create any bit of space with the hands, the turning kick is in there and it's finding that bonus score at the end. Um, and was that something that, you know, was your go-to shot? Like for me, watching the clips, it's if they're still standing there, you'll come out with a back kick. If they move back at all, the turning kick is there. Like, Which is there more to the back kick then as well, doesn't it? That it turning does. kick off the back leg into the turn of the back kick as a combination. Yep. Especially the back leg turn kick of somebody who's going backwards I'm punching the back leg turn the kick is coming out full force to the stomach mm. yeah we see that in a lot of clips really is that that's a nice combination to be able to link those up and um, it's very interesting as well that like for somebody who's very flexible and we've seen some fantastic m versions of moo moo and things like that you you were very much focused on nailing that side kick to the body and nailing the hip every time was that something that you were conscious of and um, that you just wanted that that, that absolute pressure on, on the hip um, this is something uh, Master Willie taught me. He said there's two places you kick in sparring. One is to the hip, because if you kick in the hip, their leg goes down. They can't kick because you've kicked them in the hip and they lose power for that split second. And then mm. if you want to kick to the head, you kick to the head. You don't have a clip uh, with uh, Christina from uh, Sweden, one yeah. of the Viking Opens. Where I remember going... Not, you, you don't have it here, I don't think, but I remember Viking Challenge, she came running at me and I did three head kicks, side kicks, all the way ah. back. One, no, oh. two, definitely don't two, have that there. three. So, we no, had to definitely put more, that in. A more <laughs> um, defensive headshot side kick and more a headshot turning kick going forward. That's actually very interesting because you know, these days it's the flip, flip of that really, isn't it? People try to yep. go like body on the way back and head on the way forward a lot. And do you know and what? It's an interesting one because I can't. I ha I don't think I've seen that clip, Julia. But the like in my head, I have one where uh, I think it was Hosnia Kareem did it to Joanna Proprotska, uh with a double side kick or, or something like that, and flipped a um, 
uh, a European final or semi final. Uh, and I remember being there for that particular one and thinking, oh my God, that was it. Like, it, it's six points. Or in your case, there, if, it, if the three of them land, it's nine points. Like, you know, what an, you know, an unbelievable thing. But you don't see it now defensively that often, except for maybe like the lightweight junior girls. Like, you, you can see it there to, every now and I'll again. Need to find, uh, I'll try and find that video in the, because that, the final of the Viking Cup, the flares are on. Yeah. She just wanted to kill me. She just wanted to punch my head off. And I remember going, okay, then. One, two, three. It's like, okay, I've got this now. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, Another thing actually that we don't see as well as you're saying that, Adrian, is the, the jumping punches. It's something that's kind yeah. of phased out a little bit in the modern game. Very, It was something that you used a lot. Unfortunately, it has phased out. And <clears throat> when I was competing, a jumping punch, there we go. I can't remember, in the latter years, was two, two points. Mm. Yes. So now I it's might have point. a couple in this one. But sometimes they should just, people should still do the jumping punches because it takes them off the straight line and it's clear to all four judges, even if it's only one point. Yeah, definitely. And that idea of bringing you off the line is, is, is very important as well because with the jump, it actually buys you a bit of an angle, isn't it? Definitely. Because you've got like one, two, three, four, four different angles you can jump at jump at punches. True, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of strange that it's kind of been phased out, really, isn't it? I wonder is that because of the like your your generation because of it being worth the extra scores, it was kind of in tuned in you and it's what you did, and then just like as as the scores decreased for it, then it just kind of like got phased out. Possibly, I don't know to be honest, but I still think people should do it because it gives them. A leeway and it's clear it's totally mm. clear instead yeah, of yeah. having a trade-off with punches and what you get maybe one point for it but if, from one judge but then if you get a clear one to the side you've got four point well okay one point but from four judges yeah yeah, yeah. Just and i mean i think that's a that that's a lesson in itself you know that that mode of thinking for anyone who's not like you know with us on this channel for a very long time um you know it depends where you come from but you you really do have to look at the relative values of scores to understand why a technique like that could be effective and could be worth more than it looks like on paper so it seems a huge effort to to actually you know execute a jumping punch where potentially you could just stay on your two feet and punch but the relative value of it is maybe you stay on your two feet maybe two judges see the score and you aren't changing your angle your position necessarily where as i said if you're if you are making an angle with that jumping punch three to four judges could see it it's nice and clear you go, there's there's really good extension and we see this like even with uh with side kicks with it with even with you know turning kicks to the head and so on but if the body is extended and there's a good reach on it it's far more likely to get the the score off the judges where something like a defensive side kick or a back kick you know although your opponent feels it you know it, it can be very unclear to some of the judges whether it landed properly or not mm, especially when you're close isn't it yeah it could sure. be the case if you do a back kick in a corner one judge sees it yeah and so then you get th th and then you have a warning yeah yeah it very often happens. I mean that, and and that's why I think, uh, given how the blitz has changed and how the, uh, you know, at one point in time, a retreating sidekick was a hugely popular technique. I mean, it's not going back that long ago, going back to 2013, 2015, You know, retreating sidekick was everywhere, um, and it's almost gone now. You know, people are tr mm. are trying not to use that because you just concede so much space, and if you're not you know it's fine if your opponent's on the edge and you're retreating to the center but if it's you or anywhere near the center it's just not worth it the warning uh the fact that probably only one judge sees it that the opponent might be wise to it and cover and you get no score and an exit you know it's just i suppose people evolve and the the, the techniques and strategies evolve a little bit with it as you go they do, but what do you do if somebody's running towards you and you have no other choice but to do a yep. back kick and they go out of the ring? You have mm. to do something. You take it. Yep, yeah, sometimes it. going outside the ring is worth it if you can put a stop on somebody. If you can, if you can mm. nail them with that, you know, sometimes it is worth that warning as well, you know, just thinking further along the line. And, and therefore, there again, if it lands, you may well slow them down for the next little while. Yeah, so, exactly. You yep. know, there's, that, <laughs> well, well, that's not so hopefully. bad either. Spe speaking um, of that as well, do you, do you think the contact um, these days is kind of not as m what, it, what it used to be? 
do you think that like from what we can see back in the older clips the contact was something that was you know maybe maybe the the, sh the range of shots wasn't the same but definitely the contact i feel was much higher i think the contact when i was competing was much better you didn't have head guards mm. on and you fought mm. and you fought and i think that's what sparring should be like um okay <laughs> I'm just watching this clip here. I like this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that, that was only... More... Sorry. Go ahead, Julia. I was going to say, this one is just setting up my next question, but no, let, let's hear about the, the, the contact and the, the head guards. No, I remember... No, I just... I did a few WTF tournaments, and I was like, oh, I hate this. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I didn't compete with a head guard on because it just took away, I think... I can't explain it properly, but... This might sound crazy, but I've spoken to a few friends who were in the team. They all said, we watched you. Once you got your first hard hit, then the fire just, that was that. And it was just like, go. Let you know yeah. your life. I think a head guard, oh yeah. So I think a head guard, oh, I'm just glad I didn't have to wear one. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Yeah, and you know it's a funny thing, and there's a, there's a, a range of athletes who are in that transitional period who got who trained all along not wearing them, and then all of a sudden you had to wear them, and that mm -hmm. you know that was definitely difficult. And I'm sure that the athletes who've come up who've worn a head guard all along now, you know, it, it's not an issue for them. But uh, yeah, it was definitely a change. But I, I think there's not a competitor or a coach that I've spoken to who wouldn't prefer. Uh, more continuity and less of, uh, how would you say, less of a, a worry or a hang-up around the contact. Um, you know, everybody wants a bit of contact. I think it'd be good to have less intervention from the judges. Absolutely. I think now, in general, there's too much and they're too freely of giving minus points. And I spoke to Gilles and Michael about this and loads of people. It's, people have trained for, okay, not right now, but for years and months and everything. And then somebody goes, minus point, and you're like, what was that for? And they mm. could lose a fight within, God, a couple of minutes for hard contact. We're doing a martial art. It has to be hard contact. Okay, with a reason, and I don't want to see anybody get hurt, but that's what we do. Yeah, the continuity definitely is something. It's, it's like sometimes I, I feel like, some referees are almost trying to to prove their themselves in terms of they are a good referee and they want to make an impact and i think that sometimes that actually takes away from it a little bit then as well because maybe they're being watched in terms of umpires that there's a little bit of pressure on them to make a good impression which could which potentially can put a bit of pressure to actually intervene a bit more than off than is required i definitely know with like the scottish team and my guys we have much more respect for the referees who, I'm not going to say let it go a little bit, but they understand because most of them have been competitors in the past and they understand, yeah. don't just stop it. And the ones mm. that haven't been competitors, they're like, stop, minus point. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. this could destroy somebody's fight. This could, and I hope it gets less. I think the minus points now are ridiculous for some of them, to be honest. It's for... When I look yeah. back at some of my points, I was like, I would never have survived in this day and age. I would have been out in 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it's like we said, like the idea that we talked about earlier when the warnings and the minus points are on all four judges' cards no matter what. And then when we talk about the, the idea that it's such a short round anyway, trying to get your return on the scoreboard, I think even, especially these days, it's much harder. I think back in your time, um, there, was, there was a lot more scores and there was a lot more um, interactions compared to now. Where now you you've your work cut out to get on the scoreboard, I think. I think you're yeah. correct. I think in my day we were allowed to go a little bit more, a little bit more, before they stopped it, mm. and so you could get more of a, a spar, a fight, if you like, and just keep it going. I remember a couple of referees were brilliant with me. They would go, Julia, calm down, calm down, calm down. Behind her, I won't tell you who, but they're just like, stop. <clears throat> I was like, okay. <laughs> 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 but do you know at the same time like i i think you have to look at contact as uh it's just one of the kind of the sliding scales that you can have more or less of but when you look at it in the context of all of the rules like if you want more continuity you also have to have you know a little more contact because 
you know, contact is also how you control space to some degree. So if someone wants to push forward on you, you have to hit them to stop them coming forward. Like the, your only other option is that you, you know, you almost scare them so much with the threat of a score or a three point score. But, you know, as long as someone's willing to concede, you know, a kick to the body that might lose them two points on one judge so that they can come in, you know, the only answer you have is a little bit of contact. You need to physically stop the person from coming forward, you know, and I think that's one of the, the challenges that we have now. You're How totally you really right. Stop the someone contact coming forward. builds you up, builds you up for the second or third movement. Yeah. And if they keep continuing and stopping after every hard kick, then it's, you may as well do point sparring. Mm. Well, that's it. I mean, if you have to score on your first, uh, your first shot, you know, to be able to get your the, the value from your score, it totally changes the nature of the game. Whereas in a continuous one, you can have a messy first shot that doesn't score, just carries you into contact, or a couple of punches that don't return well, as long as it lets you get the third one that does, or the the kick to the body that does at the end. So I think you know that's a that's definitely a feature. Um, the the bit I was bringing this clip clip up at actually was um the the style of punching as uh, uh, you know you've seen in quite a few places you use punching for pressure so not just here but also uh where we were looking at the the final from argentina um uh and i can bring that one up again i think uh where you're looking at going directly to hands here and uh, i suppose that's 2009 where looking at going directly to hands like i i think we start to see in 2009 and thereabouts that introduction of like what eventually becomes the blitz for most of our competitors that more like unrestrained launch to hands that uh you know so this is a little bit different this is uh i think still uh hedging your bets on the edge edge of distance and then in but i still think you know on the female side of the game now this is still more the way that people come to hands isn't it yeah i think in this fight i don't know if you know that's 2009 that was my last tournament and it in this, this was the final against Argentina and Argentina. Yeah. And uh, I had a cracked, I had a cracked femur head, so I couldn't do the push and side kicks. My hip was gone, so I had to go more with the hands and just we worked on it a lot to just launch and just throw yourself in as far as you could. Like Michael and Gilles say, sometimes it was like Superman. Yeah. Mm. But I knew I couldn't do a side kick. I could if you watch this fight I literally did no psychics because I literally couldn't but you so, know what like it's yeah. so good to it's so good to know that and I mean I know you spoke about that a little bit in Jamie's podcast as well but yep. it 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 totally changes the perception on why doesn't it because yeah like if you don't know that then well this is just a tactical choice because that that's what you feel is the best way to beat this particular opponent but um you know obviously well, you if know you're working backstory. around yeah, if you're working around the hip, then it totally changes everything. And well, whether it's the perfect solution or not, it's the solution that you have, and you've got to go and take it. And my coach and I worked around it because I knew I couldn't do certain things, but I was determined to do it. And knew, mm. nobody knew. Some of the team members knew what was going on, but my best friend Michelle knew. But some of the other team members didn't. I mean, nobody knows, and nobody can tell anybody because I don't want anybody to know it's a weakness. And I just had to change mm. everything. I think, I think actually, if we have a look at your punching style here, that launching style, it's it, it's interesting to, if we can compare that to some of the other clips, Adrian, of um, kind of like we were talking about earlier, when you're in that pocket, you're you're almost, you almost stayed where you were and you continued punching mm -hmm. in that position, we say. Um, so it's like, it's mm -hmm. interesting to see the contrast to that. Uh, I feel like like in the, the earlier clips that we've seen, your objective like was, okay, let's literally punch them as often as I can in like so see the way you're you're kind of like in the pocket and you're like launching shots in there as opposed to the launching one so even if we see like the the clip like even there you're just in the pocket instead of like driving them back and I, I, it's, it's kind of interesting to see they're both very very effective one is trying to score more punches and the other one is trying to get that backward um momentum on your opponent trying to push them on the back foot so it, it's good to have that contrast as well i think they work very well together Thank you. Mm. So uh, I think what might be interesting, there's just one or two questions that we might just pull them in and have a quick chat through them. Um, and uh, we, we'll see where we are. Just as I scroll back. So if anyone does have any questions they want to throw at Miss Cross now, might be a very, very good time. Um, but uh, we have, 
uh, let me see. Uh, from Honduras, uh, we have question in. So uh, today, 19th of February, the circle of Taekwondo, what do you think is the most important for you? So I presume he's talking about the, the cycle or composition of Taekwondo. Uh, so greetings from Honduras. The second question is, I think we've kind of covered that is, you know, your opinion on the difference in sparring yeah. now. But uh, so in terms of the, the, the circular cycle of Taekwondo, do you have a feeling that any of them are more important? The circle of Taekwondo? Uh, I presume he's talking about the whole uh, series of uh, Dalian conditioning, fundamental movement, uh, pattern sparring, self-defense. Okay. I think, I, I know everybody's different in Taekwondo, but I always worked everything because I really am a true believer in Okay, not everybody's brilliant at patterns, but the basic movements, and you, if you get the power and the speed and the patterns, if you can get the snap and the board breaking, and if you can work the drills, if you can do special technique, that gives you plyometrics. Mm -hmm. But I was always a true believer that each helps each other. Mm. And it was always one for going, if I can get as strong as I can in patterns, I can remember Master Laboda saying to me one day, Julia, how are you so strong in patterns? I went, because I practice them, and I practice them <laughs> strong, and I practice other things strong. For me, it was always about being strong and fast. Well, they're two good characteristics to start with, aren't they? Yeah. Like we can add if a little finesse jump. on top of that. If you can't jump, yeah. Strong in a straight line forwards. But uh, let's have a look here. So uh, you won't see this one necessarily, but Black Bear Jim Erlingen. So I'm presuming the Netherlands there, uh, judging by the logo as well. Uh, so Miss Cross, what's kept you motivated over the years to compete again and again, even after winning several world titles? And I suppose that's a very worthwhile question because mm. repeat world champions are not quite as common as the uh, as those who've won it once, are they? True. No, no, they're not. But again, listen to the podcast and it explains everything. But on a short mm -hmm. note, um, the first time I won it, I just loved it. I bet, bet North Korea in the final. I was like, oh my God, I want to do this again. And I want to see how many times I can do it. I don't want to just go home and go, I won it once. It was my challenge to myself to go, how many times can I win it? And that was mm. always the challenge. It wasn't for anybody else, apart from my parents and stuff, but I thought, just thought, I can see people who've done it once, you never see them again. I said, I want to be remembered for my titles and what I've achieved. Like, that's really interesting because you see that most people, their goal all the time is to win the worlds. And then they win it, they're like, yeah. what now? What, what, what am I supposed to dedicate my life to now? So it, like having that extra goal is so, so important and having that bigger why of, of the thing that's driving you. I think after the first world, I got put out the first round of patterns. I was like, oh. Then Willie was, Master Willie was my coach at the time. He said, right, get yourself together. You've got sparring tomorrow. I was like, ooh, okay. And then I won the sparring. He went, right, next time, I'm sure you can win the double. So mm -hmm. that was always my goal. Because I'd won so many Euros, at, uh, sorry, at patterns, but then I'd never won a world. So that was my next goal, to win doubles as many times as I could. Yeah, and like that, that's very rare now, isn't it? For somebody even to compete in board, their mindset be successful in board, it's very rare to see anybody being able to do that at senior level. You don't see it much now, unfortunately, mm. and um, <clears throat> it takes a lot of work, but if you work yeah. both equally, they help, they help each other. Um, from your uh, compatriot from Bathgate there, so... Uh, Harry says uh, she was certainly very strong in the gym, Balbadi Sports Center. Uh, and I'm probably making a, an absolute dog's dinner of that pronunciation, but there you go. Uh, what influence did Mas uh, now Grandmaster Sutherland uh, have on your career? Yeah, I used to uh, train at Balbadi Sports Center in Bathgate. Uh, there you go. Close, close I started, enough. <clears throat> I, started, I started weight training at like 16 and I loved it. And I think that was a big boost to the strength I had, it, of course, Grandmaster Sutherland had a massive influence on me. I started training with her when I was 11, and she was a female instructor at the time. There wasn't many of them. So, of course, I looked up to her all the time, and God rest her soul, she took us, when we got black belt, she took us all around Europe to get experience, 
to get better. And then eventually we went to North Korea. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I, was I was only. Such a, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, you, you no, go. Such an influence, it influenced my life. She made me, apart from my mum and dad, made me into this strong woman. I respected her so much and she taught me so much. It was it was interesting. I was listening to uh, Grandmaster Boss on Jamie's podcast there, talking about that North Korea World Championships, and uh, okay. uh, he was quite happy to get out of there again. He said, "But it does leave with uh, leave you with many great stories." I'm sure. Mm. There's a few great stories on the podcast. Oh, I've got many more. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let's have one from the usa so sheldon spencer is uh from baltimore in the usa is asking if you could change one rule inspiring moving forward what would it be allow more contact and let it go longer before these minus points or even warnings come out i think it it's getting stopped too fast so the athletes are not getting time to show their skills or to show their want to win there, there's too too much stoppage i can only back that up with what the uh, the coaches in the itf coaches survey came came back with and i mean that would tend to be a universally held opinion so we'll have to see how that develops um a nice simple one what's your favorite kick from nico well obviously in my heyday it was psychic without a doubt a bit of reverse turning kicks than the latter years stamping kick. Ah. Because of the hill. So, yeah. I had to change it from side kick to stamp because I couldn't mm. rotate the hip fast enough. So the highlight reel should just be side kick, side kick, side kick, side kick, you know, the whole way through. As long as it works. Mm. There's one clip you didn't show, and I hope you show it. It was the. Uh, in, from Argentina in 99, when I did the psychic, psychic backwards and reverse turning kick and I knocked the girl out. Bandy. That was yeah, my yeah. favourite. I'd worked on that so hard. And I remember pulling off, I was like, and Master and Barb was at the side of the ring going, oh no, she's going to get disqualified. Because <laughs> I'd worked on it, worked on it. And I was like, so we'll definitely have to find not. that one. Uh, I know, it's I know it's it. The things. I know it's I know it's in there. Some of them uh, we didn't cut cut down, but uh, yeah, we must definitely have a quick look for that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's one of those those things as well, though, isn't it? Where you know you've you've got that shot you'd like to land, that you'd like to throw, that you're building in there. Um, but at the end of the day, I suppose it's uh, it's good to be uh, to give the recognition to the one that is your bread and butter and that actually gets you across the line, isn't it? Mm. It's the only time I've done it. It's the only time I've pulled it off. <laughs> is that, is that your favourite? Is, is that your favourite win? Argentina. Yeah. Argentina is a really special win. Obviously, it's my first world title and I worked so hard. But one of my favourite wins, you didn't show it either, with the Christina Jelenic in 2009 at the Euros. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that was eight weeks after hip surgery. And I won the Euros. Not hip replacement. I had a whole thing. Two weeks the of crutches, six weeks training. Yeah. No, no, mm. not resurfacing. Just clean no. out. So my surgeon said, you want to win? Two weeks of crutches. So I had Whoa. six weeks of training and nobody th thought I could win. So that's probably one of my biggest achievements because nobody knew. So I bet her in the final. Mm. I think was that, was that the one in, in Raswav in Poland, was it? No, that was... Uh, 2009. Benidorm. Okay. No. No, Euros. Euros was Benidorm 2009, was it? It was. Uh, I think you're thinking of Poland. Sweden in 2010, and 2010, I think, was Sweden. 2013 was Sweden. Okay. But, Whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to watch that one, though. Yeah, well, I think w what we can do is uh, uh, we'll pop back over. We might have a look at the... Um, uh, uh, the uh, Christina one anyway because I definitely know where that one is so uh, mm. we, we can yeah because it was 2007 and that back, yeah you fought Ilona in the in the final of the Euros yeah. 2008 was in Poland I think that was against Christina and centre stage 
centre stage, but I'm, no, I'm because I had. Oh, I'm pretty sure it was 2009, but it was uh, Christina Jelenic, and I was a fourth degree, which I wasn't long a fourth degree. Okay. We'll, we'll have to go find that. It's a, yeah. It's probably one of my favourite. It's only one round. You don't see the final, but yeah, I watched Say it today. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I if I drop that Say one second. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to see where that one went to. In the we'll background, show. maybe on your browser. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump out of that one and put it in properly. Give me two seconds yeah, yeah. now, uh, because yeah, we do have that one for sure. I think that's um, actually my video on YouTube. I think I put. Is that it up. really? Yeah. Yeah, it's in the background. Yeah. Let me find that there. Um, yeah, there we it go. Just on, um, on, on, on 1999 as well. It, Richie in the background. Probably. So I was yeah. Yeah. Did you not hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's important to get that clear. You, you're definitely energy. doing the cheering. Yeah, yeah. But as well, I think uh, it's um, like even on the 1999 Argentina, the, uh, the, was that the last time with the, the ITF were all together? That world? Uh, no. Uh, no? Ooh. No. 2001 in Rimini. Oh, God. oh okay. Yeah. Still, uh, like, it would have been a massive one then, 2019. Yeah. That's in 2008 in Roswell, Poland. Come on. <laughs> But, you know, and again, it's it's one of those ones where, as you said, very special for you. And that wouldn't have been obvious to us watching that for the why. Mm. And, you know, I mean, I remember I did, I think, seven Viking Cups in a row at uh, at around that that time when it was, you know, still very much the Viking Cup that it, you know, the, it was that huge event that it was. And, uh, you know, really saw, would have expected Christina to be coming. Uh, because she'd been making huge uh, leaps over the, the the couple of years there, and an absolute tough cookie, but uh, oh, totally, uh, you know, uh, and it, and a girl, nothing fancy with the legs, but she really just loved to get to hands and finish. Well, she loved to punch. Yep, my psychic. <laughs> yeah, a bit, bit of reach as well. To be, she should probably uh, have used those legs a bit better. But she couldn't use legs because she couldn't kick no. above the belt, and no. I, oh, no. I always knew that. Um, but I knew she, she was tired. Yeah, she trained. Uh, she trained with uh, at a Stockholm with Arto, and uh, yeah. Uh, it, but it, it, she did a lot of boxing as well. She was definitely uh, very happy to go punching. Um, but you'd usually only see the turning kicks coming in. But she had really nice uh, distance and really committed when it went to hands. So I think, as I remember from, because like, you've you've had a couple of great fights with Christine over the years, and the, uh, you know, drawing her into the punches and making the the side kick count or the back kick count uh, as she came in was a big mm -hmm. part of getting the results. Oh, there's that jumping punch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what, how, how do you Does feel she... when you watch these back, Julia? Ooh, well, <laughs> when Adrian sent me them today, because I don't really watch my fights, to be honest, because I can't do it anymore. Mm. But today I watched them all, and it brought back some really nice, great memories, some sad memories. I yes. just thought, did you, did you get that itch? <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Of course I do. Um, I've got two hip replacements. I'm waiting a knee surgery right now. I wish, I wish I could do it. And sometimes I think I can, and then I realise, yeah, I'm going to break my body again. Mm. So, that's it's it's nice to watch, and I'm glad you two made me do it because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. <laughs> cool. we're, we're, but, we're delighted to have you. Absolutely, but you know what? And it's it's a thing as well where you have to remember, no matter how phenomenal you know a person is as an athlete or how mediocre someone is as an athlete we always we all end up in that same place that we all get older we all you know lose some of the abilities and faculties that we once had so we just have to you know live while the living's there you know and and, and that's what you've done isn't it like you, you know while it was possible to do it you did it for as long as it was possible to do it and there's no regrets in that i think you know and i think that's you know that has to be the message in it I think the only regret I have is not going to fourth degree sooner to do Moon Moo properly <laughs> because then my hips started to get bad and I couldn't and that's okay that that's my only regret I don't regret anything else yes I've got all these surgeries I'm going for my 11th one shortly 
But you know what? Probably wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, you can just go for the world title for most surgeries and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> do, do, do you think I'll get my master's for that? Just for those surgeries? <laughs> You'll be able to write a dissertation on it, but, you know, by mm. the time you get to the end of it anyway, you know, uh, a practical experience. Um, I suppose we just have one last question maybe to throw in there before we finish and, you know, conscious of your time as well. Um, in your, this is uh, from uh, Black Bear Gym, which is in Germany, not the Netherlands, I was corrected. So in your opinion, how important is physical strength for competing in ITF and how strong is strong enough? And I particularly like the second part of that, actually. <coughs> Whew, that's a tough one because I worked on um, <coughs> strength and conditioning with, a guy that used to be in the Scottish team or for years, he moved to America, Alan Cosgrove, and he used to send me programs. Because I was always, within my weight, I didn't have to like drop loads of weight. He said, so we need to build you up as strong as possible. So I think it depends on what weight division, weight division you're in, how much weight you have to lose, because obviously muscle is heavier than fat. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So I was lucky in the sense, I just worked on strength, strength, and like speed, speed. I think I was fortunate that I didn't have to lose like 10 kilos. And I think some people, they can't do the weight training. But I think weights are really important because they make your, your body feel strong, but also your mind. And it's mm. not always jumping about the ring. And I love the gyms are shut right now, so I can't do that. But I love weight training. I just, it makes me feel great. And just, I'm not going to say empowered, but it makes me feel better about myself. Mm, get them endorphins. Because, be, yep, because I can't jump about. I love swimming. I love weight training. I love going on the bike. So, yeah, that's my endorphins. So I'm mm. missing that so much. <laughs> I, like, I think it's interesting as well. Like, do you think that most people, like, overestimate the importance of strength training in itf of course we need that foundation like you're talking about but i think that some people absolutely live in the gym and they don't do any skill training i think that you need to get that balance right don't no. you you have oh, to have a thing when i was competing i used to have a, a schedule that i wrote out and alan helped me and it was like right day one you do this in the gym then you do patterns Mm. Day two, you do this in the gym, then sparring training. And so it's always mixed up. There was never, you know, I, I never wanted to like bulk out. It was always for yeah. like speed strength, if you know what I mean. Mm. Like explosive strength. It wasn't bulk strength. It was functional. There was a purpose to it all. To supplement your, yeah. your, your taekwondo really, isn't it? To, to it. speed the punches up, to make sure they were stronger, the kicks, mm. everything. Yeah, I always find yeah. it so much easier to train all of those ancillary things when it's for a purpose. Like, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's to make your, it's to make your sparring better, it's to make your pattern better. And then when you're training towards that goal, it's great. I just don't think for myself, it was, it was, it, it would never be motivational enough to say, ah, oh, I want to look good. Um, and obviously I failed miserably on that front. So <laughs> the, 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 the point for me was always, right, it's got to be about that performance side of things. So, yeah, um, that's been, it's always the, the best motivator. No, I never did weights to look good or stuff. I did, there were some girls going to the gym with their little tops on and stuff. I was like in a T-shirt and bottoms. I was like, I'm not interested. I just want to train. So. Mm. There you go. Let that be a lesson for you. Yeah. Um, so is that is that all the questions that we have, Adrian? Uh, yeah, well, we have a short one from Damien Carthy. If it was any other sport, what would it be? Or if there was going to be any other sport for you, what would it be? Swimming. I used to there be a competitive swimmer when I was younger. And I had to give it up because my mum said, you need to decide if you want to do swimming or taekwondo. You can't do both. <laughs> right choice. Practical realities. Yeah, and you know, yep. if you want to be t if you want to be a top swimmer, it's going to take a lot of hours. So uh, you definitely couldn't mix that with anything else, could you? No, my mum said I'm not getting up at six o'clock in the morning, then taking you to taekwondo at night. So make your choice. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. I did the same. I was doing the ten hours, uh, like five mornings and five evenings a week with swimming until I was about uh, eight or nine years of age. So uh, I actually stopped swimming and started taekwondo. So that was a that was on my on my journey as well. 
So there you go. That's the, that's that's the secret, everybody. Get, get in swimming early Swim. if you want to be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So, Julia, thanks a million for today. It's been an absolute pre- pleasure and a, a lovely trip down uh, memory lane for me as well. Uh, mm, because it's been, I, well, it's just been such a pleasure. And thank you for making me feel happy and make, making me watch my videos. <laughs> oh, you know, any any time whatsoever. Yeah, so it's fantastic as well for so many people because so many people look up to you as well. So it's great for other people to be able to get an insight as to your your mindset and things that you are thinking about training. And so it's fantastic for the the wider community, especially in these times of COVID. It gives other people a little bit of hope as well. So so thank you for coming on and sharing sharing your journey with everybody. Do you know you're so welcome. And I said to my mum today, I went, I'm really quite nervous. She went, Julia. I went, Mum. She went, you can do this. I went, do you know what? I can. So thank you for making, th- I think hmm. this year's been hard for everybody. And I think you lose a little bit of confidence yeah. in yourself with, hmm. with different areas. Because you're not seeing as many people. But no, thank you guys so much. It's so lovely to see you both. Can't wait sometimes to give you Absolutely. this big, big hug. Yeah, very soon, hopefully. The next time we can hop on a plane. Oh. So Richie, do you want to take us out of here? Guys, yeah, fantastic. Are you going Listen. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Are you yeah. going to stay on for two seconds? We will. We'll stay for on. Sure. Yeah. Great. So we'll wrap up the video here, guys. Thank you so much for joining in. We had some great questions. Everybody who tuned in, we really appreciate it. Make sure to hit that video, thumbs up, share it with everybody in the Take One Low world. Subscribe if you're new, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. <laughs>